Hello everyone, my name is Mr. Kluge, I am the band director at Westchester Middle School. And my name is Mr. Collins and I am the band director at Westchester Intermediate School. And we are here to talk to you today about a wonderful opportunity that you have now that you're in the fourth grade or if you're a fifth grader in our school and didn't take this opportunity last year, that's to become a part of our band program. As a part of our band program, you get to do many things that other students who are not in band don't get to do. For instance, the band students that are in our district have had the opportunity to go play the national anthem at DePaul University home basketball games. They've been able to travel out of state into other cities such as Cleveland, or Cincinnati, Indianapolis, and we've been downtown Chicago and played concerts at places such as the Field Museum, and we've been outside by the Bean in Chicago. So those are some of the great opportunities and things that you get to do just because you're a part of the band program. But perhaps the best thing about being a part of the band is that you get to learn what it feels like to make music not only on your own, but with your friends too. And that's a real special feeling that you get when you're able to do that. Now, to be a part of the band, you have to learn how to play an instrument. Now, there are some instruments that we teach and some that we don't teach as part of a band. Mr. Collins is going to walk you guys through that. Mr. Collins. All right. So if we take a look at this table behind me and kind of in this general area, <clears throat> we have in our woodwind family, we have a flute. We have the clarinet. Uses a reed. We have the alto saxophone. Also uses a reed, a little bit different shape. Stepping over here for our brass instruments, we have the trumpet. Notice that brass differs from woodwind. It uses a mouthpiece. Mr. Collins, if I may, to make that sound on any of the brass instruments, we have to do this lip buzzing thing like this. It's kind of a funny sound, but that's what you need to do in order to play the instrument. Uh, it's a great skill to have. And then this is the French horn. Notice a different, little bit different shaped mouthpiece. And I'm going to get back to this French horn in a second because I want to talk about it's a little bit special in the, in the fact that we actually own these, but more on that later. Um, we also have the trombone, a little bit bigger, and instead of the valves that you saw that control on the instrument, this uses a slide. So you have almost like infinite possibilities with a trombone. Allow me, Mr. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Kluge. The baritone, you can see that's almost like a little mini tuba. It's more in the range. Actually, it's pretty much the same as a trombone, except it uses the valve. So if you have shorter arms or maybe, you, you know, this is a little awkward to hold, I might recommend the baritone for you. <clears throat> and then the, the bigger... The bigger version is the tuba. The tuba has a very low sound. Um, it looks heavy. It's actually pretty light. Um, for its size. I always like to tell students that you can't have a good band, a good sounding band, if you don't have the bass. Got it. Right? Bass. So you get a lot of the bass with the tuba, with the baritone, and with that trombone. Crucial to have those instruments in the band. Absolutely. 100% Mr. Kluge. Um, and as promised, I did say I was going to come back to the French horn. Um, along with the two instruments that Mr. Kluge held up, the baritone, the tuba, and the French horn. These are all owned by the district. So um, we own these and you know you're able to pay just a cleaning fee up front. It's not a rental fee. It is it is merely the price of maintaining these instruments and keeping them available for students to play here. Uh, so you get to keep one at home and keep one and normally in a normal year you'd be able to keep one at home and one here and just transfer your mouthpiece back and forth. But you would able to you you would have to pay a cleaning fee, and then you'd be able to take one of these home uh, from our stock of inventory. Now, of course, mom and dad, if you wanted to rent your own French horn, your own baritone, your own tuba, you could definitely do that through our music supplier Quinlan and Fabish. But if you want to take advantage of the fact that we do own these instruments purchased over the years, 
Um, and then, as Mr. Collins said, you get to have that one at school when we return and one at home. So you're not having to carry an instrument back and forth. You're just carrying that little top part, that little mouthpiece that you do the buzz into. That's what's carrying back and forth from school. So it makes it a lot easier to handle those bigger and important instruments. Mr. Collins, are there instruments? Oh, I guess we still have the percussion, right? Yeah, I was going to talk about really quick. Um, I just wanted to make sure I touched on the woodwind and the brass instruments and then also the school of instruments. We also have the percussion family over here, um, and that constitutes two different instruments. So I always like to tell my, my students, if you're, if you're up for a challenge and you want to learn more than one instrument in a specific discipline, percussion um, is, it, it's, it's a little more of an undertaking because not only do you play the drum, but you also have to learn. It's kind of like a piano um, using sticks, what we call them mallets and you'd have to know your scales and your notes. So just a heads up, if you're looking at getting into percussion, you would have to almost do double duty. You'd have to be able to play not only the drum, but also the mallets as well, and have the same type of note recognition that the rest of the band students play. So it's a little bit more work and a little bit uh, higher expectation when you become a percussionist. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Mr. Collins, are there instruments that we don't teach here in our school district? Thank you for bringing that up, Mr. Kluge. Um, we, we don't teach the stringed instruments, so anything you might see um, in an orchestra, uh, like a violin, a viola, cello, uh, the big string bass, also, we don't teach uh, guitar in, in band because those just aren't traditional concert band instruments. Um, you know, but feel free, you know, if you're interested in playing guitar, I don't want to discourage you, you know, from learning it on your own. For instance, I took piano as a young student outside of school, and I had a piano teacher and piano lessons that I took every week. And when I was old enough to start the band program, I started on a band instrument too. So we, we encourage you to keep taking lessons on piano, guitar, or any other instrument you're taking lessons on outside of school, that's only going to help you as you learn to play a new band instrument. Um, so please keep those skills going. In fact, if you play piano, that could make instruments such as percussion a little bit easier to start up because the piano keyboard is laid out just like those mallet or the bell instrument that Mr. Collins was describing earlier. All right, well, everybody hold on to your seats because... Uh, Next, you get to hear Mr. Collins and I demonstrate what these instruments sound like. And hopefully that will not discourage you from joining <laughs> band, but a little encourage you from starting band. And you'll get to, to make a more informed decision on what you might like to play. Hi, welcome back. So we did talk about um, instrument demonstrations, and this is that segment. Um, so I want to cut right to the chase and, and talk about um, some of the woodwind instruments that you're going to be able to play in band or you have the potential uh, the ability to play. This one is called the flute, uh, as, I, as I said before. Um, this one you'll notice is part of the woodwind family, but it doesn't use a reed for tone production, so it's a little bit different. You would almost blow across and down at an angle, kind of like if you've ever you know, created a sound on maybe a two liter bottle of you know, Coke or, or Sprite or Sierra Mist, whatever your favorite beverage is. Uh, if you've ever blown across the top to make that ooh sound that a bottle empty or full would make, um, then this is that same type of um, idea, it's the same type of thinking. Notice how my hand placement, one is under and one is over. So you'll need to kind of stretch your fingers a little bit um, to play all these keys, okay? And it's kind of like, with some of the other instruments in the woodwind family, you would play them like this, except the flute you want to turn and bring it up here. Okay, and notice how Mr. Kluge and I talked about how important it is to keep this 90 degrees, right? So you see your face, you don't want your flute like this, you don't want to lean it down here or lean your arm against a chair and play like this. You want to make sure, especially since this is not heavy, you want to make sure that you have this 90 degree angle here, okay? So I'm going to play a little bit and just uh, play a couple notes and then I'm going to demonstrate a song for you. So as you can hear, it's a very delicate, very soft sound. Um, but it can, also, it can also be powerful the more air you put into it. It's a very dynamic instrument. Um, 
I personally, even though I grew up on percussion, I've, I've grown to love all the instruments for their own unique uh, personalities and characteristics. Um, so now to get to the fun part, I'm going to play a little tune you might recognize. We'll see. So a couple things. Um, one, I want to. I want to. It was kind of obvious that I made a couple mistakes, and I, you know, I want to leave that in because I want to show you that it's okay even after applying. It's okay to make mistakes, and and the big thing I want to I want you to take away from that is when you start playing, it's going to be natural to make mistakes. So don't get upset with yourself. Just keep going, and that's going to be one of the hardest things to learn. But yeah, this is the clarinet. Um, so the clarinet, you're going to hold vertically, which is uh, different than the flute. We held that horizontally. You're going to hold this up and down. Um, so real quick, we have a mouthpiece. We have a couple different pieces. I'm not going to disassemble this now, but know that if you do play this, I will show you how to put it together, take it apart, and clean and maintain this instrument. Um, so we have the mouthpiece. And what I want to talk about is since this is the wood, one of the wood instruments that uses a reed, um, it's important to soak this reed. Uh, this is done typically two different ways. You can either put it under you know, your, your kitchen faucet and use water. Typically what musicians do, um, because when they're putting your instrument together, they might be on stage or in a professional like musical pit, like if you've gone to see a musical like Hamilton or, or maybe Wicked, um, the, the musicians are already down, and so the only way to get a reed really wet down there is to put it in your mouth. It might seem weird at first, but it's completely natural, doesn't really have a flavor, although it'd be kind of be cool if they were strawberry or grape flavored, right? Make sure you don't bite down on it to break the reed, because if you crack this part, it's not going to make a good sound. And a squeaky clarinet is not too pleasant. So the other thing is taking your time to set up and make sure your reed is straight. I'm using this thing called a ligature which is the metal band that tightens the reed and holds it against the mouthpiece. I'm going to make sure I don't push down too hard or slam it into my leg to put that mouthpiece down. I'm going to twist and use some gentle pressure to get that down. And now we are all assembled. Everything looks like it's in line. So I'm going to play a little, a couple of different sounds and show you uh, the range of the clarinet. So it's, it can play very low. You know, so if you like some of those bass sounds, but you know, maybe the the bigger instruments were a little intimidating. I think the clarinet's going to fit that bill. So if you like something low, but you want something a little more compact, clarinet's going to give that to you. So that's a bit of the low and middle register. And now what I'd like to do is play some of the high notes for you. Um, those are a little bit tougher, and, and the, the challenge with the clarinet is um, there are open holes in the clarinet. So unlike the flute, where you just push down a key, you will have to have your finger covering the whole hole, otherwise it will squeak and maybe create something like this. And that's, you know kind of not too nice of a sound. So just be careful with that and know that you're going to have to cover all the holes. Um, so uh, I'm going to give you a classic one. Uh, if you've been into the internet culture in the past, I'd say 20 years, uh, you've heard of this song before, um, usually as a joke. So uh, I'm going to give you this hit by uh, Rick Astley from back in the day. <laughs> in our uh, woodwind family. We have the alto saxophone. Um, also, mouthpiece, reed, ligature, like I discussed with the clarinet. 
But uh, this reed is pre-soaked, so you don't need to watch me uh, do that again. But you would want to soak this reed just like we talked about the clarinet. Um, the thing that's different about this instrument is that you need a neck strap to hold it. Uh, this instrument can be a little bit heavy. And what I find uh, a, a common mistake that students make is they try to hold the whole instrument up. You see there's this little pocket back here, this little hook. That's for your thumb. And students who don't have their neck strap set up properly, if it's too low, they're going to push, they're going to try to hold it up with their thumb. And that's going to put all this weight on this thumb right here, on this joint, and it's really going to hurt over time. So I want to get you started, or at least thinking about this, before you even get instrument, before you even think about saxophone, make sure that all this is set up properly. You know. You want to make sure that everything is, is, is adjusted the way you want it. Even though you're going to be excited to play, you can't wait. You want to make sure that you do the prep work first. So right now I'm setting up my neck strap so that my neck, my body is going to hold up the sax. And my thumb merely is going to push the saxophone out to bring it into my mouth. So it's not balancing or pulling this thumb down. My thumb is merely pushing the sax out to bring it to my mouth. And therefore, I'm set up. And if I need to make micro adjustments, I can pull down on this neck strap from there by a little bit or a lot of it, whatever I need. So right there, that feels pretty comfy. I'm sitting up, back straight. I have the saxophone ready to go. Um, like clarinet and like flute, you're going to need both hands for these keys. Um, right hand goes bottom, left hand goes top. You'll see a lot of other pads and things. It looks very complicated, but once you find, you know, once I help you, and once you figure out where to put your fingers, it's going to get a lot easier. Um, but I'll play a little bit of saxophone for you right now. This is the alto sax. <laughs> also has a nice range, um, a lot like the clarinet. I can go high and I can go low as well. So I'm going to play you a song you might recognize, your parents might recognize, but I guarantee you if grandma or grandpa are sitting around, they're definitely going to know this song. Um, I remember it being on, on reruns on Saturday mornings when I'd be wanting to watch cartoons. I remember this would be on it's a show called Hawaii Five-O. Okay, hi everyone, uh, Mr. Kluge here. I'm going to demonstrate the next five instruments that we're, we're going to have for you. And these instruments are all members of the brass family of instruments. They're called brass because they're made out of a metal that is called brass. Um, all the brass instruments, you make a sound. You may remember earlier when uh, we were discussing the instruments, I did a little buzz sound. To make it a sound on all of these instruments, the brass family, you have to do that buzz. And when you do that buzz on the shiny silver part at the top, which is called the mouthpiece, you get this sound, and then when you place the mouthpiece into the actual instrument, the instrument changes the way that buzz sound is, that we're going to hear that buzz sound into a much more pleasant sound or tone to listen to. So once you make that buzz sound and you learn how to flex your lips a little bit, you also learn which combinations of the three buttons, in this case on a trumpet, which combination you're going to make to change the different pitches and notes of the instrument. So I'm going to go ahead and play a song for you that might be pretty familiar to many of you Star Wars fans out there. And again, this is on the trumpet. So that was the 
trumpet, our highest sounding brass instrument, and I'm going to move on and be right back with the French horn. Stay tuned. All right, so I'm back with the French horn. Um, the French horn is a very beautiful sounding instrument, no matter what I sound like when I play it for you in a few minutes here. Um, very beautiful, often found in string orchestras as well. Uh, again, a little mouthpiece like I talked about with the trumpet, and the same thing with buzzing. And again, with the French horn, this is one of those instruments that we own many of in the district that you could actually take advantage of having one of ours at home and one here to use when we return to school for a small yearly cleaning fee. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate the French horn. Again, just like the trumpet, you also have three buttons to help you change the notes. And you do that with your mouth as well, with changing your lip pressure. So here's the French horn. I'm going to play two songs for you here. One for you Disney fans and one for you NFL football fans. <laughs> The French horn. So unlike the other brass instruments that I've demonstrated so far, the trombone is the brass instrument that doesn't use the combination of keys or buttons and the, and the lip changes on the mouthpiece to make the different sounds. It uses a slide. And there are different spots that we place the, the slide to make the different notes, and they're called positions. So if you decide you want to play the trombone, you learn what is called first position, second position, third position, fourth, fifth, sixth, and the stretch arm uh, position, seventh. That stretches you way out. You learn those different positions and you learn how to make the different sounds of the notes. The trombone is an instrument for those of you that maybe have, have seen the Westchester Middle School Jazz Ensemble in the past. It's a very important instrument in that type of band. So if you like lower sounds and you think you might want to do jazz at some point, this might be a good instrument selection for you. So here is the trombone. I'm going to uh, play two tunes for you that they might be pretty familiar. <laughs> The baritone sounds a lot like a trombone, very similar. However, the baritone, you may have noticed already, does not have a slide. It, we're back to the keys. We're back to the, the three buttons. And again, when you learn the proper combinations of those buttons and working with the mouthpiece, you make our different note sounds. The baritone, once again, is um, one of those instruments that the school district owns many of them. So we are able to uh, help you out with that and set you up with a baritone at home, at school, for that small yearly cleaning fee. So here's the baritone. I'm going to play a tune uh, for you video game lovers out there. Uh, Mom and Dad grew up playing the video game that I'm about to uh, play the theme song for, and, and maybe you're familiar with it too. <laughs> Super Mario Brothers for you. I'll be back momentarily with the tuba.
right, the tuba, the lowest sounding instrument in the band. I always say the tuba is like the roots to a tree. You know, if something happened to the roots of a tree, the tree would die. Well, if something happened to the roots of the band's sound, the sound would die. So you can only have a really good band if you have a couple of tuba players down there at the bottom supporting the rest of the group's sound. Very important instrument. And again, our final one where we can set you up with one at home and one here at school when we return so that you're not carrying a tuba back and forth, you're just carrying the mouthpiece back and forth. So here we go with the tuba. Let me give you a real low note though first so you can hear what it sounds like. Watch out, a boat's entering your living room. Anyway, here we go with We Will Rock You. And now for a little Iron Man. Hi, Mr. Collins again. I'm going to demonstrate uh, the percussion. So as I said, there are two main instruments that you're going to have to focus on. The snare drum and the bells. Uh, typically we call this like battery percussion and mallets. Um, so two different tools to utilize both instruments. Uh, whereas, you know, woodwind players might have um, a reed, brass players might have a mouthpiece. Percussionists have both drumsticks and mallets. You're going to hold them two different ways as well. Very similar but a little bit different. Um, so with sticks you want to make sure that the tops of your hands are up like this and I like to think about creating like a piece of pizza or cake or pie or whatever you might like to eat, whatever your favorite dessert or food is. But in essence you want to create, if I lean it forward a little bit here, you want your sticks to meet in the center to create kind of like that piece of pizza or pie. You can definitely see it a lot better, hopefully that way. Um, but you want your, your sticks in the middle, and you want to think about bouncing your sticks like you bounce a basketball. So you kind of throw the ball down, it hits the ground, and it comes back up to your hand, and you're able to kind of catch it and keep it going. So it's a continuous momentum. And it's the same thing with sticks. You don't want to take your stick and grip it really hard and just push it into the drum. You want to bring the sound out. You can even hear that sounds better. I'm going to demonstrate poor technique once again, pushing into the drum, which is bad. And then now if I bounce it like a basketball, you can hear the drum kind of comes to life a lot more. So I'm going to demonstrate a little bit on the snare drum. So right there, it demonstrated not only how loud the drum can be, well, it could be louder, um, but also how quiet it can be. So um, one thing I learned uh, that I thought was really interesting that never really entered my mind, the percussion, especially the drum, um, is the most wide, is the widest dynamic range. So it, not, it can not only be the softest in band, but it can also be the loudest. So I think it was uh, Uncle Ben in uh, Spider-Man, right? With great power comes great responsibility. So um, you, you're able to be very delicate, but also very loud with the drum. So coming over here to the bells, these mallets, notice how I'm, I'm, I held the sticks back a little bit. I didn't really get into this, but if you do get into percussion, I'm going to demonstrate this a lot more and, and help you out. But I was more toward the back end of the stick, okay, with about maybe about an inch off the back end. And mallets for control because we're not bouncing, we're not bouncing the stick. We have to lift off the mallet from the bell. So you can't push it in, but you're physically going to need to hit and pull the mallet up. So for control, we hold our mallets up about halfway. So just to give you an idea of what you need to do. 
So I'm going to demonstrate a couple notes and I'm going to play a song for you. So, um, this one, if you're familiar with dance tunes, this one's called I Like to Move It, Move It. So there you guys have it. We just demonstrated all of the band instruments that you have to choose from for starting in our band program. <laughs> a couple of things I want to talk about. So um, make sure that you know you fill out all that information. We're going to get that medium to you, whether it be on you know a website that I create or a Google document. Um, you want to be sure that you pick two different instruments. It's it's imperative that you do. So you want, you know, after everything you saw here today, between the brass, the woodwinds, and the percussion, um, hopefully you at least have one choice, and then you definitely want to think about that second choice. The reason being is Mr. Kluge and I have been talking a lot over the summer and brainstorming and figuring out how this is all going to work. You know, we looked at how, what other directors were doing, and then, you know, we took some of those ideas and then developed some of our own. Um, so to keep this fair, usually what we do is have students come in and try the instruments out. Since we can't do that this year, we're um, uh, going to institute a blind lottery system. So that's why it's, it's more important than ever to pick you know, not only your top instrument but your second instrument because we're limiting each section um, to a certain number. So then that way, you know, um, I don't have a, a, a group of, let's say, 50 saxophones in the whole band, and then, you know, they, it just wouldn't work, right? So, um, thinking about that, we're, we're instituting a blind lottery, literally pulling names out of a hat, not looking, and it's, you know, those people are going to get their first choice, and then, you know, say that their first choice was flute, and if the section is full, we would ask that student if, you know, the second choice was applicable, if not, you know, if there was something else they might like to play. Now, it could be that we maybe don't even need to use the lottery, um, but that's just there in case we have to, because as Mr. Collins said, if we have, if we started a band with 50 saxophones and only one person on every other instrument, for example, the experience for you musically is not going to be a good one, and we want everyone to have a real musical experience and for that we need what's called balanced instrumentation so that's why if we have to we will be using that lottery system so please again make sure that when you respond to Mr. Collins on whatever form that may be please make sure you list a first choice and a second choice instrument from the ones that you saw and heard us demonstrate today Please do not run out and just get an instrument right away, okay? Please wait until Mr. Collins has approved and lets you know what you're, if, if you're going to get your first choice instrument or not. Okay, so please wait to get an instrument until he communicates that back to you. Also, we want to talk about something that is called an ISO. ISO stands for Instrument Shaped Object. Okay, and these are often, um, often presented from big box realtors. Sorry, not big box realtors. Retailers. Right, we just talked about this. <laughs> these are often, these are often found at big box retailers yes. and online retailers. Um, they look like they're of great value, and they want to sell your parents. Um, a really good valued instrument for a cheap cost. The problem is, is they're not of good value. They're often made with inferior products, inferior metals, um, and they break very easily. And there is nothing worse than a poor quality, a poorly made instrument in the beginning when you're a beginner on an instrument. That's going to set you up for failure. Yeah. So and to piggyback ahead. on that, sorry to interrupt, Mr. Kluge, but. Um, you know, I've had students who um, 
maybe purchased uh, or their parents purchased an instrument of poor quality or even maybe um, even as something as simple as a, a poor quality reed and uh, students have had to struggle and fight through terrible sound they're frustrated because you know it their clarinet or, or whatever instrument isn't working um, so just you know to piggyback on that you don't want you know to get started poorly and then be fighting your instrument and and as a beginner you don't even know what's going wrong you're trying everything you're following mr collins or mr Kluke's instructions you're doing everything you know in the book but it's just not working out um the other thing to piggyback on some of those isos mr Kluge talked about them breaking um i guess putting myself in the consumer's uh shoes if i invested money in an instrument and it got damaged or broken, as, as sometimes you know accidents happen. Um, not being able to repair that instrument because all the people who repair them won't touch those instruments because chances are they're afraid they're going to do more damage trying to repair that bent valve or whatever it is. So um, you know, just kind of a um, something something of importance that I know as a consumer, I would I would be extra. Let's see upset, irritated, um, aggravated that my hard-earned money went towards something that now is, is you know, just going to be a, a paperweight. Right. I mean, the old saying, you get what you pay for, is really true here. And it, it, while it may seem like a great value in the short run, in the long run, it's going to um, cause nothing but headaches for your student uh, or for you as the, as the musician. For years, many years, we've worked with a music company called Quinlan and Fabish, and they are locally right here in Burr Ridge. Um, we get a weekly visit from our rep named Ashley, who comes out to our school buildings and will take instruments in that might need a repair, will bring us supplies, you can order supplies that you may need through her directly, and it's very, very convenient. But most importantly is Quinlan and Fabish makes sure that we get quality instruments all right, so in closing, uh, make sure you read through the Beginner Band Handbook. It's going to have a lot of important information in there. I also, uh, through brainstorming, Mr. Kluge and I, you know, developed a lot of ideas in what we would add as an addendum, actually, at the beginning of the packet, because there are some things that are not going to be applicable uh, with remote learning this year. Uh, hopefully, you know, that can maybe change, depending. We're, we're keeping our hopes up that we can get together as a band and create beautiful music together. Um, but just in case we can't, there's a lot of information at the beginning describing some of the changes, some of the things we talked about. Um, well, it would be nice to see, too, in the rest of the handbook, it's typically, other than this beginning section that we're adding this year for COVID, um, it's, it'll be nice for you to see what a typical year would look like. So the rest of the handbook is pretty um, you know, typical to what you would get on other regular, we'll call them normal years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, beginners participate in two concerts a year. Yes. Uh, you know, one in December and then one in the spring. But again, that's in a typical year, not this year. So you'll be able to read through the handbook and, and just see all of that regular information, let's say. And I've designated uh, that with, with like a parenthesis and a group of stars. So you'll see what is not going to be applicable, but what would be applicable in a normal year. Um, so another thing, uh, be sure to tune in uh, September 16th. That date is also going to be listed in the Beginner Band Handbook, but just to give you that, you know, keep it in the back of your mind. September 16th is going to be our kind of parent night. What normally would take place in the cafeteria here at WIS with big tables and, and all the pageantry included, um, we're going to have uh, Mr. Kluge and I are going to be in... in um, on online as well as Ashley you know that instrument rep you heard from Quinlan and Fabish so you get to meet her ask her questions and we're gonna do it in in our segments so we're gonna have from five to six six to seven and then seven to eight so uh, I am also going to include information uh, in the packet and it's gonna be split up based on the first letter of your last name kind of like we normally do it in the cafeteria but um, since it's digitally we can probably have some more people uh, included on that at different hour segments. So any questions you have for the directors about instruments, um, about the program, about opportunities available, uh, and then you know any questions you might have for Ashley, for Quinlan and Faber. She's very knowledgeable. She knows about everything going on and she'll be able to help you out with any financial questions or anything you might have.
Mr. Collins and I both obviously feel how important music education is, and, and specifically band in this case. And um, we really wanted to, even though we're restricted to what we normally do, we really wanted to get a class started this year. Um, just know that we will probably require a little bit more patience. Um, we know, you know, on the part of Mr. Collins, who will be teaching the beginners, um, a little more patience there for him, but also for you at home and for your child. Um, because obviously teaching remotely is going to create a different set of obstacles for not only the teacher but also for the student. So hopefully with hard work and determination, um, if your child really wants to start band, which we hope they all do want to, we will get through this and we'll get back to a regular band experience soon. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing to think about is, you know, through art, um, children and even adults are able to express emotion. So this could be an outlet, you know, for your child to be able to express some happiness, some joy, some uh, some some different ways they might not have even thought. Being able to put it through the sounds of music. So, so we, we look forward to seeing those return forms um, coming back with a first and second instrument choice, and we look forward to uh, seeing you at our online um, Google Meet or yeah Google, Google Meet Meets, yeah Google Meet uh, beginner band parent meetings. And uh, I think we look forward to getting your child started really soon in band. And please don't hesitate to contact either one of us if you have questions uh, in the meantime. Thank you much.